I'm delighted to be here with uh, Lieutenant Colonel Nigel Harrison, who retired from the British Army this year after about 36 years of service, um, serving in the Royal Signal. And I understand that you've operated in every continent apart from Antarctica and 37 countries and in 1991 were awarded uh, an MBE for your um, services liberating Kuwait in the first Gulf War. Um, and your specialisation was around electronic warfare um, and information intelligence and security or information security. So was going into the military, going into the forces something you always wanted to do? Did it happen sort of later in your childhood? Uh, it was actually uh, a fairly simple uh, decision quite later in the school time, but uh, before I went off to university. Um, and I wanted to do something with variety uh, and something where I felt I could make a difference. Um, and I think it was actually probably the Northern Ireland conflict which uh, motivated me to uh, uh, do that. Uh, but it was actually many years before I actually got to Northern Ireland. Um, uh, I got diverted off to uh, various other war zones mm -hmm. and uh, uh, opportunities to uh, uh, serve. But um, no, it was it was sort of 17, 18, and uh, the sort of the, the height of the conflicts in Northern Ireland in the early 70s, which uh, sort of motivated me to uh, uh, join the army. So when you when you started on your your military career, um, I would imagine it must have been a um, for a while there wasn't so much conflict and then towards the latter part of your career really quite a lot. Uh, surprising actually how many conflicts there were. Uh, I joined at the time of the Cold, the Cold War. Mm. There was conflict in Northern Ireland and I uh, had a, a, a number of friends who went there and uh, uh, did, did great stuff, uh, a couple of who were injured. Um, but uh, I was involved in the Falklands War I was involved in the peacekeeping operation in Lebanon in the early 80s, uh, just after the Israeli invasion of Lebanon. Um, and then I went to uh, try and help keep the peace in Central America, in, in uh, Belize, and, um, and, and such like. So I, I think there was quite a lot there, but certainly most people's modern memory is, is Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, and uh, such like. But uh, it, there's been a, a, a history of minor conflict for a, an awful long time. And so I, I suppose your, your experience is you know, very diverse, as you say, from um, peacekeeping to, to full-on conflict. Where was the, where did the, I suppose, what was the catalyst to going into electronic warfare and intelligence and information security? Where, where did that come from? I, I think I was attracted to uh, electronic warfare and uh, the, the modern equivalents of, of cybersecurity, information warfare, uh, and such like, uh, because it's a cat and mouse game which has been there hidden, uh, mainly from public view, forever. Um, it's something that happens in uh, peacetime, it's something that happens in the, the work up to conflict, it's something that happens uh, whilst you're in conflict. So there, there is a continuous uh, three theme there of trying to uh, find out what the other side are up to protecting yourself um, and, and such like. And uh, I think that quite motivated me uh, from, a, from a technical aspect uh, and actually just from the intellectual challenge. Mm, sure. And, and was, there, was there something specific that occurred in, in one, one of the scenarios that, that you were in that, that led you to think actually there's something else here, as you say, that's on a, on a deeper level, if you like? I, I think the um, it's something probably you drift into because there certainly when I joined there wasn't much uh, publicity and, and advertising about this side of military life mm. but it um, it's something effectively you almost get invited into uh, and you complete the security questionnaires and, and get your um, uh, high levels of vetting and then you're sort of in the club and brought into the fold and, and, and find out uh, a, an amazing hidden world of um, cat and mouse, as I said. Uh, you were awarded your MBE in 1991, um, and it was the work that you did in the liberation of Kuwait in the First World War. Was that, um, had you been very involved in um, 
I suppose, information security and intelligence. Obviously, you had prior to that, but is that where it sort of escalated, if you like, and, and, and therefore became something that you really specialised? Uh, I'd actually got involved in the, the, the whole uh, piece of uh, uh, intelligence, electronic warfare and such like before uh, Q8. Uh, and I was partly involved in, Q in the Kuwait conflict in, in that sort of area, but uh, it was a very much broader role. Uh, and I, to some extent, feel a little bit of a fraud because I was one of the uh, backroom workers in, in... But they're very important. <laughs> yes, they are very important. And, and it's not, it was nice to feel recognised. And I think the, uh, the entire sort of backroom staff who, who helped make the technology work which meant that we could move the force uh, the, the forces from uh, northern Germany where they were in cold war they were all geared up for that we moved them to uh, Kuwait and they suddenly had to work not uh, on nice hilltops and such like in in uh, the reasonable temperatures of northwest Germany but uh, suddenly they had to work in the scorching heat of the desert uh, over vast distances mm -hmm. and it needed a lot of technology and I was sort of my job was really to corral the engineers the research scientists and such like who who made that all happen and so that in quite a different way as you say just the extremes of temperature the extremes of the environment oh absolutely and a, and a real big challenge and it um it lasted about uh, eight, one, eight months in the preparation period my uh intensity so nothing like the uh, intensity of action for the people on the front line but uh, in trying to help make it happen mm. um, and it's all about I think in that sense uh, working with a very uh, diverse team geographically dispersed uh, but building up trust and bonds with them uh, and being able to get them to go that extra mile and you can only do that if you've built up that trust with people and you uh, a rapport they trust you you trust them you know how much you can delegate they know uh, to, to come to you if there's any problems that need um, uh, decision making and I think it's in, in that sense as well it's making timely decisions not making them too early mm -hmm. because there's always the uh, we talk about the fog of war but it, it, it's there I think in civilian life as well as in military that sort of clouding of, of haze of what's going on and you work out when you have to make a decision and then you make the decision at that time mm -hmm. but it's um it's yes trust uh, that that you've making that the best decision you can at that right sort of time uh, and you're uh, as part of that you've worked out the capabilities of how long it's going to take people to actually react to what you're saying and to be able to uh, deliver the effect that you need um, and such like so it's, it's a you know a, a very different different environment particularly my ex uh, my experience in the Gulf War was working with a military civilian scientific uh, industrialist community to, to make things happen and uh, it, it's a common purpose is absolutely um, essential but it's uh, as I say I think the, the the word I would use, if, if I have to, is um, you, you lead and, uh, and such like pull people together by trust, mm. developing mutual it's, it's trust. It's a really interesting point that you make. So I know, you know working in businesses is a piece around leadership and, as you say, vision and people really understanding what's going on. Trust is a very difficult one. And um, I know, you know we've had conversations before around the fact that when you're perhaps in a, in a in a military environment you get to know people extremely well you know you live together you eat together you do just about everything together so actually getting to know people perhaps um, takes a shorter time than maybe it does in, in a conventional business sense and I, I wonder what you what you would say to people that say oh you know we can't possibly do that how can we get to people get to know people as well because you've obviously transcended military life working with a whole variety of people and now very much in, in uh, a different environment. Yes there, there, there is um, it is a different environment uh, and I, I've seen particularly over the last um, uh, few years I, I've worked um, in, in government uh, and very much more in a civilian environment mm. uh, but again that um, building bonds uh, and trust and rapport with people I, I spend a lot of time doing that I think that's key 
because when you need to call on somebody and, and call in that favour or get that just that little bit extra out of people, if you've invested some time doing that beforehand, then that pays dividends at the, at the time you really need it. So I, I think that's the same with the military and civilian life uh, and, uh, and such like. And I, I think it's, um, it's even more needed when you're working remotely from people and you're by and large working with them in a, a different countries, uh, video conferencing or telephone calls, emails and such like. It's just trying to build that rapport, uh, trying to understand where they're coming from and trying to understand, get uh, where you're coming from across to them. Mm. And that makes it much easier when you really have to uh, pull out the stops. And it, yeah, it's interesting you say that because I, I know when I you know, work in businesses, but people do find it very difficult when people are remote because it takes longer. And as you say, you have to make an investment because you do have to take time to get to know people. And certainly in, in a remote environment, it's so much more difficult. Um, mm. But it's obviously something that you've, you've got very accomplished at. Um, latterly, um, you've been an advisor to, to the Cabinet Office and, and recently set up the, the UK Cyber Challenge, um, which, um, as I understand it, is, is a great um, initiative to recognise talent in the UK um, to, to bring, uh, I suppose, young people into that environment. Um, did that um, play to those strengths around making that happen? Because obviously it's something that didn't exist before. I, I think it did. Um, and we, the Cybersecurity Challenge um, is, uh, only happens because people develop, not necessarily come with the right same agenda, but they develop a common agenda. They develop the common uh, motivation to, to, to work with this. And we work with a diverse group of something like 45 companies and government organisations now and academia who, who all pull together to, um, to deliver this common goal of identifying new talent and getting those talented people into the cybersecurity profession, into business. And people come to that uh, and maybe a, a large uh, IT company uh, commits to it. They might not see any results this particular year because actually they, uh, but they've given something to it. Another company's given something to it or a government department. And it, you work for a common good and you know you'll build and see the end results because you may not get that f person first time around, but people move in industry. So you're just increasing that talent pool um, and actually getting companies to um, understand what your agenda is, understand what their agenda is, and work get companies mm. to work together. But it seems to have is some exactly the same as work getting. It's, it's but it's the same as getting individuals to work together. Mm, for sure. Um, and, and the same sort of levers come from that. Um, you know, it, it, it's there are subtle differences, but it actually the. The, the corporate drive in, in getting company A to work with company B to work with government department C for a common purpose. Um, I thought it was going to be a really difficult challenge, but it's it, it's been fairly easy mm. to, to do. Well, it seems to have developed phenomenal momentum since you set it up on, I think, was it three years? Three it's, we're now in the third year of operation. Third, yeah. um, the, the actual numbers of people we've got into the industry uh, is probably uh, in about three figures. So not massive numbers at the moment. Um, we've probably had several thousands play our competitions, but it's partly pump priming. It's about raising awareness. It's getting people to make decisions on what A-levels they're going to do, what university degree they're going to study, which way they're going to see their career path going. So there's a lot of, a lot of it is... Um, it is sort of a slow burn, planting a seed, getting people thinking that way and, and, and such like. And we won't see the real benefits in some of these cases for a long time. Uh, but it's, it's great working with people who just um, 
not just the, the, the companies, but working with the individuals, mm. oh, sure. young people, yeah. and, and actually some of them are sort of in their 30s or, or maybe even their 40s, and they want a career change, mm. and they just can't find how to get through the sort of glass door, the glass wall from, from one career into cybersecurity. What was interesting when I was sort of looking at various websites and the information that's out there is that it's in itself it's quite creative and it's quite innovative. Yes, it's a competition and you have to deliver a, a piece of, of technology. However, you you, um, you very much you know, advocate that people do that in a creative and an innovative different way, you know, almost whichever angle that you come at, which is, is not, um, that doesn't always happen. No. And so that in itself is quite, it's quite different, I think. Absolutely. And, and it's really great to see some of these people who come through our competitions um, develop and blossom as the year goes by. Um, we, we run competitions which, first of all, uh, baseline people's technical skills. So we, we get the, yes, these people are, um, they, they know the geekery, they, they can do the, the technology piece. Mm. And then we really put them under pressure and we are trying to look for the people who can not just uh, deliver the technology, understand about hacking techniques or, or, or whatever, but then are actually people who can work as part of a team. Mm. They can uh, prioritise, they can react to uh, emergency situations, unfolding situations. They can put a uh, an investment case, a business case to a senior manager in, in role play circumstances mm. and we can see them, how they uh, develop and persuade that this is really something the company has to do and we see those people do that and the the people at the top of the pinnacle we, we're placing straight into jobs are, are really fantastic that must be phenomenally satisfying it is very very satisfying yes you talk about pressure um and the students that come through the challenge all very well designing something but then of course taking it into a very real world environment where you have so many other pressures adding to it um having the military background that you have, I'm sure you've had challenging days that many of us couldn't even imagine. What sort of tips or insights would you give to people that are looking to make a change in their career or shift direction or, or set something up like the cyber challenge or whichever for those days when it's hard? I think it's uh, perseverance. It, it's determination to do something different, make a difference. Um, and... Actually, I have suffered a lot of setbacks in my time, frustrations in things, and it's just trying to put them in perspective. I think that I, when I was young, much younger, I used to worry um, that I just couldn't do things as best I could and, and such like. Perfection was one of the drivers of me. And it used to keep me awake at night, sleepless nights, worrying about these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Um, and I then sort of developed a max of, of, of you know, you have made a small step. The, you know, people talk about baby steps or whatever. And that, that is something, as long as you can look positively that you've, you've achieved something in that day, you've, you've made one step forward, you, you've, you may have not gone straight down the path you want, but you've gone slightly offside, but to the side, but at least you're moving forward or, or um, you've taken a side step around an obstacle and are now working out how you're going to go around it and I think it's just it's it's being part of that um, glass half full mindset sure. rather than the glass half empty mindset mm. and I think when I was much younger I was very much more of a glass half empty woe is me I, I, I look at things in the very negative sense and I mm. think it's having that positive sense. And is that what drives you now, i.e. that piece around progression and driving things forward and doing as much as you can, be it on the board of directors of the Cyber Challenge or as professional secretary of the Royal Signals now, is, is, is that the piece that, that drives you? It is, yes. I think it's making a difference. Um, uh, that, that motivates me. Um, and it, it's having a belief in something. Uh, it's... Um, it's a, achieving something, and, and yeah, money money is not a, a major motivator in my life, really. It, it, it's, it's achieving something, achieving a legacy. 
something I'm proud to look back on um, in, in whatever I do um, and reflect in. Um, and to be fondly remembered, I think, is, is what drives me. Fondly remembered by my peers, fondly remembered hopefully by people I've helped uh, in life. Um, and and yeah, it's perhaps trying to help instill that positive attitude in others around me.